What's fun about poisoning people? Because you poisoned me that one time with that one soup, right? What soup? <laughs> I oh got really God. sick. It was like lemon something. I don't think it was a You're soup. I don't know what that means. with that too, by the way. <laughs> I was like so excited. I'm like, I made homemade soup. And then for the week you were like, you poisoned me. And what did you put in that? And I was like, oh my <laughs> God. I put love in that. That's what I put in there. All right, Marissa, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right, Marissa, so you're my sister. Uh, you are an entrepreneur, an empath, a creative, and you're the owner of Wild Honey Artistry. Is there anything else you want listeners to know about you before we go on? Um, no, I'm sure we'll get into it, though. Awesome. So... Let's talk a little bit about your business. So Wild Honey Artistry, um, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, why don't you explain what you do? Um, okay, so I was formerly known as Wild Honey Brows because I originally started um, on my permanent makeup journey years back, which was about seven and a half years ago now. Um, and when I transitioned into fine line tattooing, which is what I do currently, I changed my business name to Wild Honey Artistry because I wanted it to be general instead of um, just brows because now I don't really do much of the permanent makeup. I am more focused on fine line tattooing. That's kind of where I ended up. So, Awesome. Uh, so could you tell a little bit about like how you ended up where you are because I like it, the shirt by the way. Yeah, yeah. Bob Honey <laughs> Artistry. Representing. Can you uh give a little background to like how you got to where you are? Because you know, I've known you my whole life. <laughs> and uh <laughs> or your okay. whole life. And uh one of the things that it it seemed to can't come out of nowhere because you got your your esthetician license at a certain point, but you didn't like pursue it right away. So there, it seemed like there was a point in your life where you maybe didn't have the direction that you currently have that oh, you yeah. didn't know that you were going to be doing what you do. You're currently doing. So yeah. how did you actually, you can go back as far as you want. How did you actually end up doing what you're doing? Um, okay. Well, I'll just start at around, I think it was, was I trying to think of what age I was, but um, I, didn't know what I was going to do shortly after high school, graduating high school. I took a little bit of time to be a little bit of a wild child, I feel like. And uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And at the time, I was like, okay, esthetician school. In my mind, I was like, oh, it's probably like quick schooling and something that could be fun. I didn't really like put too much thought into it. I kind of felt like I needed to figure out what I was doing quickly. So I enrolled in aesthetic school, but started to get really excited about it because I was um, starting a career path, you know? So went to school for that, graduated, and I actually didn't really do much with it right after I did some skincare. Uh, like I was like selling skincare, but I didn't, I didn't really do much with it. I didn't actually find it that exciting after all when I was, when all was said and done. And I just got into the service industry, making money that way, bartending, serving, doing um, that type of work for a couple of years. And I think it was, I was bartending in Vegas and I had been at the same bar bartending for about four years. And I was honestly miserable. I was working for, not the greatest company. And I was kind of lost in what I was doing. Cause I knew that was not what I was supposed to be doing. I was a creative at heart, which I always have been. And I feel like I just knew that there was more out there for me. And, um, on the side of that, I started to do photography while I was bartending and really found like, that was like my first passion got, uh, I bought a camera and equipment and started just shooting friends. And then it turned into a big creative outlet for me. I didn't really make it into business because I mean, I was like making money doing it and whatnot, but it's kind of 
it's, it's a hard thing to get into as a, a business owner. And so I, it was more of like a creative outlet for me. So, and then I, I don't even really know how it came about. Well, I, I got my eyebrows done. I got them microbladed by uh, a girl in Utah, which now is my very best friend. So that's actually how this sparked. So I went and got my eyebrows done. She was actually an instructor. And we got to talking after she did my eyebrows. And and um, I was like, I wonder how that would be, like, if I took a course and got into that. And so I contacted her afterwards and asked her some information about it and then realized I I left my esthetician license uh too long so I had to get all that reinstated and mm. redo the testing and everything obviously was being irresponsible with that cuz I should have just kept it going and what do you call that like kept it reinstated or whatever yeah. So that I didn't have to go through all that. But honestly, it was probably a good thing that I had to like do the testing and refresh my memory and everything. Um, so reinstated my license, took the microblading course, drove to Utah, did like a three, it was like a three day weekend course with her. And I just was like, I actually really like this stuff. Like this is fun. I can be creative. Um, I wanted, I always wanted to work for myself. That was like a very, very big goal for me. I think even since I was younger, because I just never liked being told what to do. (laughs) So, um, took the course, found my second passion and I actually started my microblade business out of the guest room in my house. And, um, literally just started a whole business out of my spare room and obviously was not legal at the time. I mean, you have to have the right, um, you know, your house has to be a certain way closed off and whatever for it to be legal, but it got me to where I am now, which I'm legal now. So it's fine. Uh, but I started taking clients that way and, saved up for I think it was like two years I was doing that and then I was finally like I'm gonna rent a studio and um yeah I feel like my my business just blossomed in Vegas then after that and I tried different services you know within the PMU industry and then I would say I did permanent makeup for well microblading for like five-ish years until I was turned on to fine line tattooing. It was coming new to the industry. And I um, was like, oh, because I feel like I always remember when I was younger, because I was I would draw and paint and stuff like that. And I remember a random thought in my head, like, I would love to be a tattoo artist. That would be so cool. Never thought much too much of it. So yeah, I actually knew a girl which is another really good friend of mine now um she had been in the permanent makeup industry for years and years owned hair salons everything did it all and she um announced that she was going to be teaching fine line tattooing and i was like that's what i want to learn from like i just like felt her energy too and we had never even met but i was just like intuitively i was like i feel like that girl is gonna like teach me some things and I just felt good about it. So I actually waited till she released her, her course. Cause it wasn't out yet. And I waited and then I drove up to Utah, even further up to Utah, close to you in Salt Lake and, uh, did a training with her, fell in love with that. And then that just sparked my whole fine line tattoo journey. Now that's basically, I'm strictly doing that instead of, I just kind of, transition into fine line and i think that's where i was always supposed to be so you still do the brows a little bit right i do like two a month maybe like i I don't really advertise it anymore if someone sees my work and they want to get it done i still love doing it it's just not my i just really love tattooing so so yeah so with the fine line tattoos are they you said it like came to the industry what does that mean because i I mean, I was surprised when you started doing it because I had no idea that was in the realm of esthetician. So yeah, yeah, what do you mean there? Well, it's different state by state, but in some 
states, it kind of merges into uh, like permanent makeup can be known as body art um, in some states. And then fine line tattooing kind of falls into that. But again, it's so different in each state um, how they regulate it. But when I say it came into the industry, I feel like fine line is a newer technique. Um, you know, we come from traditional tattoo work, thicker lines, bigger needles, stuff like that. And it seemed that a lot of permanent makeup artists were starting to take this on because we work with a lot of the same, it's, it's a lot of the same needles. Um, your machines are very similar depending on like what you use. It's, you know, permanent makeup artists are known for focusing on detail. And I think fine line really is like such detailed work. So, um, you know, there's, there is that part of the industry where every, it's like, it feels like every permanent makeup artist wants to be a fine line artist. And I just don't think it works that way. I think not, it's not meant for everybody, which is like, you know, creative things in general, it's not everyone's going to be good at it. But there's tons of artists out there that they just naturally pick it up and it kind of, you know, their work can merge into that. And I feel like that's what happened for me. I feel like I smoothly transitioned into that instead of having like a big hiccup and feeling like I I was learning a whole, well, of course I'm learning a whole new technique and like there's, it's, it's a lot of the same, but very different. And, um, but for me, I feel like I just smoothly transitioned into that. And, and I feel like that was, you know, on purpose. I feel like I was meant to be doing that. So, or doing this. So. So you kind of mentioned intuition, um, a little bit. Do you feel like you've always been intuitive or do you feel like that's something that you had to nurture? Like, because you say, oh, like I was meant to do this and I, you know, it just kind of went over smoothly. Yeah. Is that something, because I, I consider you one of the most intuitive people I know. How do you, like, have you always been intuitive or has it been something that you had to like work on? Like maybe it's there, but you, you weren't, weren't connected to it. I would say that everyone is intuitive. It's just about tapping into it. I feel like. You know, it's like looking back now, I feel like I was intuitive intuitive as a kid, too. I was connected to that. But obviously, when you get older, you start to actually be way more self-aware of those things. But, I mean, as far as I can remember now, I at least as like an adult, I've operated off of, off of uh, intuition, but definitely more so. Honestly, I think I became more intuitive when I went off on my own and started a business and had to really like rely on myself for a lot of things and connected in different ways. But, um, it's, it really is a big thing about trusting yourself too. And I feel like the more in tuned and trusting you are of yourself, the intuition just kind of comes with that. So yeah, I'm very big on like intention and intuition and all those things. I run my business that way. I run my life that way. So. Were there times where, has that ever led you astray? Like, have there ever been times where you couldn't tell what you should do and you couldn't figure out what your intuition was telling you? Well, that's always the hardest part about trusting your intuition is sometimes you feel like, is this ego? Is this intuition? What is this? And that's where you kind of have to really lean in and take the time to just be within yourself and figure it out. Cause you know, we're human and we're going to make mistakes and stuff, but I do feel like every time I have truly listened to my intuition and trusted myself, it's never led me astray. I do think that I've always ended up right where I was supposed to be. And that doesn't always mean that I'm going to end up in like, the perfect spot, but it's the perfect spot where I'm supposed to be at the time. You know what I'm saying? So, so yeah. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between ego and intuition? Like when you have that dilemma, it feels like such a hard question to answer. I mean, yeah, I don't really know how I don't, that's something I don't really know how to articulate. It's, it's more of a feeling, you know? 
And I do feel like once you connect to yourself more, that's when you're able to decipher between the two without like, it's hard to, it's hard to articulate. It's just like a, a, a knowing or a feeling, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, with uh, the industry that you're in, it's considered pretty competitive, right? Yeah. What's your advice for people that are, or what would you recommend to people who are faced with that dilemma of going into an industry that is, they're being told it's competitive, you know? Oh, I mean, you just have to ignore that because there's going to be competition in like um, high demand industries regardless. and. I think one thing I was always really good at, especially with permanent makeup, because permanent makeup, as far as the way I felt with it, was way more um, competitive than I feel now with doing what I'm doing now. But um, I just always tried to be really good at staying in my own lane and not really worrying too much about what other people are doing, which, you know, social media makes that hard because you compare yourself all the time. But I think focusing on your craft and keeping your head down in a sense and not really worrying about what other people are doing and really just get inspired by other people rather than feeling like there's competition or jealousy or anything like that. I think that's really, that would be my biggest advice is to just do you and stay in your own lane and like really focus on your craft because your art is your art and no one else, it's no one else's. So. Yeah, that's what I would say. I agree with that. I tell people, you know, the people I interact with, I tell a lot of people, you know, I don't have competition in my space because I'm I'm just trying to be me, and I'm Mm -hmm. no one's going to compete with me on that. Yeah, I'm not trying to be somebody else, and I I think if I think what you said is the best way to go about it, because if you're trying to be, if you're trying to just do things because you see other people do them, not that you can't be inspired by that, but when you start to try to emulate people too much, then then you are competing because you're trying to be them. So you're trying to compete with being who that person naturally is most likely. And that's when you end up in, I just think it ends up being harder at that yeah, point. Yeah, and you're just not authentic with what you're doing. And I do yeah. think, again, social media makes that hard, especially for artists and creatives because yeah, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what other people are doing because it is art. But when you put stuff on social media as like a show board for people to judge and whatnot and to show, you know, there's just a lot of comparison. And like, I think that creates, um, uh, what is it called? Um, imposter syndrome a lot for artists and creatives. I mean, there's, there's, (laughs) There's memes or not memes, but like there's, you know, where you could like repost sayings and stuff on social media. Like there's, there's things that say like imposter syndrome and all this for a reason, because it's, it's out there and everyone feels it. It's just to, to what extent, but I mean, I've definitely felt it many times as well. And I know the people I'm close with in the industry too always feel it. It's just part of, I think that's just part of being a creative. I don't know if that's ever going to go away. So yeah, definitely. I I have it all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I can definitely resonate with that. Yeah. So what do you uh what do you think is the hardest part about starting a business? Like actually starting it yourself and going on and obviously when you decided to rent the studio, you had a big decision on you cuz when you're doing it at your house, you're already living at your house, right? But when yeah. when you are Going into a studio, you're most likely signing a one-year agreement with that studio. Yeah. You have overhead, so I don't know how much it costs, but let's say it's $1,000. You're like, okay, that's $12,000. I need to make more than that to yeah. get my money, get my money's worth. Like, What were the hardest decisions as you started to build out your business? Um, well, it's taking the risk on yourself is always scary because you don't really know. And, you know, there's a lot of people that quit after a couple months of doing, um, you know, it's, I keep referencing back to permanent makeup because I feel like that's the time when I felt a lot more of these things. Um, I feel like now I'm in such a groove. It feels really good, but, um, I, and obviously I've been in business for years now, so it's a little easier, but I do think when you're starting from 
scratch, it's scary because taking that risk on yourself financially, mentally, everything, it's, it is scary, especially hopping into a studio. It's like, okay, I've been making money, but like, am I going to be making, am I going to pull in enough clients in a week, in a month to like actually, you know, pay for what I'm renting and like then have money after that. And so I think it, it's a big financial risk, but you, you know, the, I think the hardest part is you're the one in charge of it. There's no one, there's no one out, you know, there's no one above you orchestrating how you do everything. And then you, you're kind of in charge of everything yourself. And so you really only have yourself to rely on. If I don't have, if I don't bring in clients, then I don't get paid. It's just like, you know, so you have to definitely find the drive, which I didn't have a lot of drive when I was younger, actually. Um, not that I didn't have drive, but I just was not focused and motivated in the way that I am now, which is like weird. I don't really even know where it came from. Um, but yeah, you have to have that and not everyone has that. And usually the people that fail in business, it's because they just didn't give it enough effort, I think, you know, and there's just some people that there's, there's killer artists out there. They're amazing at what they do. And then there's artists that it's just not their thing. So, you know, like good work brings in clients. So kind of have to be good at what you're doing too. Yeah. You have to market a little bit too. Like you said, if you don't bring in clients and, and, that, and, and that, and that's a huge thing too, is marketing yourself is that's huge. Like that's how you get clients. I mean, without social media, I don't even know how people would be doing anything now. Um, cause yeah, you have to be your own. I mean, there's people that hire out too, but like, I know that I never, I just did everything on my own cause I like that kind of control and I like how things are set out for people to see the way I like advertise my work and everything. And so, yeah, you definitely have to be motivated with the marketing because otherwise you're, no one's going to know what you're doing. No one's going to know about you. So with your, with your focus, do you feel like that was more maturity or was it just being in the field that you wanted to be in? I think that I finally found something that I was passionate about besides like, you know, the side project of, of, uh, photography, but I think I, it just sparked something in me. I think knowing that I was like capable of, um, you know, I had a passion and I thought I was, I felt good about it. And I think just having that and the idea that I can do this, like I can create my own business. Like this is actually, once you actually see it and you're like, it's actually possible, I can do it. And so I think that lit a fire under my ass and I was like, okay, I'm, now I'm motivated. So. Yeah. Um, when you started to get more serious about where you wanted to go with your business, was there any, were the things holding you back because you, you had other jobs that you just kind of didn't care about? I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. then, then when you start something for yourself and you get more serious about it, were there things that you're like, I don't know how to do this? Like, how did you figure out those things oh, yeah. that you maybe didn't know how to do? Like, where'd you, where'd you go? Yeah, I will say, I mean, if you're speaking more in like, down to like services and how to do things, how to perform certain services, techniques, whatever. A huge part of that was having a really, really solid community through social media, which um, there's some girls that really, really created a network of really passionate and supportive women. And that was a huge thing because I don't know that I, it would have given the confidence to me and other people if that wasn't there. So yeah, there's, there's definitely people in the industry I could thank for that, for starting just like a really solid community of women that like supported each other. You could reach out if like, you know, I could text someone and be like, how did, how did you do this? I don't even know, or this is going wrong. I don't know. What am I doing wrong? You know, they had, they had Facebook, um, what do you call it? Facebook, uh, groups. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, that just helped support. and hmm. but. On the other hand of that, I, I'm someone that likes to figure things out on my own too. And so a lot of what I did, I feel like was, uh, 
kind of just winging it and learning it on my own. You know, I learned a lot. There was a lot of stuff that I learned just from even with tattooing. Like I took a course, but I was never taught how to do, you know, like realism stuff or whatever. And I, in that, I feel like I'm just now getting more into that, but it's kind of like intuitive work. I feel like for me, I just trusting myself and then seeing how it turns out. And I feel like to me, that's more fun sometimes anyway, creating. How do you get the practice that you need? Like with fine line tattoos, because you, you're you doing them on a person. Yeah. Obviously, you, you, did, you do uh, something prior, right, to prepare. But if, you, if you're doing something on a person, how do you get to that point where you're actually like making the tattoo you want mm-hmm. and not messing up on four people before you get to the yeah. point where yeah, you need to be? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people out there that practice on people before they're ready. And it's... Uh, it's not good, <laughs> but, no. um, there's different ways. I mean, there's, uh, it sounds kind of gross, but there's like pig skin. It's the closest mm. thing to human skin. So a lot of people that are starting out will use that, uh, to practice or there's like fake skin pads, stuff like that. Um, but honestly, like me and Brandy would just like tattoo each other or I'd tattoo myself. Cause there's nothing like the feel of real skin when you're actually learning. Um, and this was like before I even took my course. So I was dabbling in it before, but you kind of just learn as you go, honestly. Um, but yeah, I definitely think having the hands on training because there is different tra- training styles. Some people do it online, some people do it in person. And I think there's nothing like hands on training. But then again, everyone learns. Like I'm a, I'm more of like hands on visual learner and everyone's different. But I definitely think having the in-person training is really important. So Hmm. when it comes to like marketing on social media, you said that was really important for you to grow your business, but how did you, how did you learn how to navigate that? Like were there times when you were just doing things completely wrong, not getting any engagement? Cause you, you have a really good Instagram following and that's your only that's your only platform that you really use, yeah. right? Yeah, just Instagram. So obviously it didn't start where it is right now, but like talk a little bit about your journey with that. Oh yeah. I mean, that was in the beginning kind of rough because you're so focused on the numbers. You're so focused on like how many followers I got in a day, how many followers I got in a week. And you kind of get a little lost in that in what's actually what actually you should be focusing on because you know social media where we feel like more validated if we're getting that type of uh what's the right word i'm looking for the dopamine hit yeah i guess so and so um yeah in the beginning it it sucked i'd I'd message brandy and be like oh my gosh like i don't understand how i only have like this many followers but blah because you'd be doing ads and you'd be doing you'd be posting your work that you thought was so good and then you get like 10 likes on it and it was just like kind of torture I finally let that go and I'm like I can't worry about that anymore um and when I really started not focusing on that I feel like you know you get to put energy into more into your work but yeah I feel like in the beginning the whole social media thing was it was daunting really, really daunting and feeling like you have to be not only a business owner, a creative, but also like your own marketing person, your, you know, but also for me, I feel like I kind of, when I started having fun with social media and really focusing on just posting stuff, I really enjoyed and not so much of like, I mean, obviously I care what people think I'm putting my art out there, but really posting the stuff that made me happy and whatnot, I feel like it just got better. And then Mm. my aesthetic, I think as well became more, uh, I guess, noticeable or like, I don't know, people would notice like uh, they can relate wild honey with like the aesthetic, you know? Yeah. So I think it's fine. I think it's finding your, your, your nook with that too, like finding your aesthetic, you know, it's, 
down to even like your color, like what you use tones and colors and stuff like that, that catch the eye on Instagram is like important too. That's why I do a lot of black and white photos. Cause I think it just looks cool and it looks classic to me. And I like, I like that type of stuff. So. Yeah, you do have a certain aesthetic and you like the more, what monochrome kind of stuff. Is that right? Yeah. Monochrome. Yeah. Yeah. I like more like neutral tones and um, I was never one of those girls that liked bright colors and whatnot. So I kind of, and it's funny because people come into my studio and they're like, Oh, like people that have been in my home or whatever. They're like, your studio in your home is kind of like similar vibe. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's just like a general aesthetic, I think. So yeah. I'm, I'm the opposite. I like color. I like a lot of color. Yeah. Right? We're really different in that way. Yeah. I like I like bright colors and yeah, just I like my trippy art. I like I like bright colors and stuff like that, just not for visually for like my business, you know? Yeah. But um I mean it works for some people though. When I decided to have the black light on in the background, I was you know, I asked a few people, some people thought it might be too distracting and stuff like that, but I'm like it's me. It's what I like. So I'm yeah, just going to do it. I don't it. think it's distracting. Yeah. When it comes to like competition in your field, like I, I've wondered this. It, it seems like if you're creative and you're passionate about what you're doing, then you're going to be fine with whatever field you go into because you're probably going to outperform the average person no matter what in those situations. Unless you're just really bad, and it's possible that you have a passion for something you're bad at, yeah. you know. Yeah. But do you feel like a lot of the, a lot of the competition in a field is a lot of people that are doing things like in the field because they just don't know what else to do? Like, as an esthetician, do you be, do you think that a lot of people are in that field not because they want to be, because they don't have other ambitions like people go into hair a lot for instance mm-hmm. and uh they don't really some people really want to do hair but then there's a bunch of people that would go in to do hair because they don't know what else to do is, I think as, so. I, yeah i think a lot of that is there's people that really are passionate about it whatever but i do think in those type of in those type of industries a lot of people just do it for the money because they hear the money's really great. You get to kind of work for yourself. The money's great. And it's and usually the people that literally just, I know at least for me and permanent makeup and tattooing, whatever, the people that are literally just doing it for, for the money are not usually successful. So yeah, I do think like hair and so, you know, there's always going to be people that just get in because they, they think it's, you know, they think it's easy money. So. How do you measure success? Mm, good question. Um, oh, I think for me, success for my business is if I'm booked and happy and at peace and enjoying what I'm doing, uh, and able to still enjoy my personal life and then have the balance of my work life. To me, that's success, I think. Nice. You have like a bunch going on all the time, right? Like, so you're really busy? Yeah. Yeah, mostly. How do you, like with your focus, how do you know what to focus on and what to like maybe put on the back burner? (laughs) (laughs) Are you keeping that one in there? Keeping it. Oh. That, I didn't expect that one. That's hilarious, actually. Oh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> How do you determine what to focus on and what to, you know, keep in the distance <laughs> keep on the back burner? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> hang on. You have to ask me that a third time, I think. I just went blank. What do I know? What do I know to focus on and what to... Yeah, with so many possibilities, how do you focus on the right thing? How do you know you're focusing on the right thing and 
especially as a business owner? You have so many things that you can be doing. Um, I think that's why I stay on a regimen. Like I'm very routine in my like daily life. Um, I think that helps me stay focused on what I need to stay focused on. And if I don't have routine, I'm a little chaotic and that probably will play out in my work life too. So I think staying on routine for me is huge for that. And then I, I am more clear minded on what I need to focus on too. And I've, I've always been really big about, I, I don't like to do too many things at once when it comes to like my work. Um, because then I just, I, at least for me, I know, I know there's people out there that can handle they're like tentacles. They can handle a million things at once. I just know I don't operate well like that. I get overwhelmed. So I think really just having a few solid things to focus on is better for me. That Does that make sense? Yeah. So if with your routine, how do you, what's your routine like? Like my daily routine? Yeah. Yeah. What do you like? What are the things that you what are the things that you want to do each day with your routine? And are there certain things that if you don't get to do those, they mess up your day? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you from the get go with my, I would, you know, try to get good sleep. That's a big deal for me. Um, but waking up in the morning, I typically, I used to do my creative process at night, which I still do, but I, more recently started to do it in the morning, like drawing up designs and stuff for clients. Um, so I'll do a little bit of that when I wake up. Uh, if I don't have coffee, then screw it. The day's over. Um, <laughs> so having some caffeine is a huge one for me. I typically spend time with with my dog, Benny. And then um, my work hours, are t- I typically always keep them generally the same. My, the same days, the same you know, general hours. Cause that keeps me on track. And then I think a huge thing for me is just staying active, you know, working out. That's a really big one for my mental clarity. Um, and that's one that if I feel, if I feel like I'm being taken off my routine, it's, it upsets me a little bit, but yeah, I think, I think those things, spending time with the dog, staying active, um, being able to have a social life and like spend time with my friends and stuff like that um, also helps me to be creative when I am in that mindset too. I've done the whole burnout thing um, yeah. when I was doing permanent makeup and I promised myself that I wouldn't do that when I moved. Although it was probably bound to happen when I moved out here because I was starting all over again. And I actually don't feel like I did that. I feel like I kind of went straight into, cause I, I started to book out here so fast. So I don't, I didn't feel like I had to, uh, to do the whole burnout thing again, to start over, which I'm very, very grateful for. But Remind me where you are. Are you introverted, extroverted? Or are you like right in the middle? I think he did this test for me and I was like both. Okay. I always right. thought I was more introverted, which I am, but I'm I definitely am extroverted too. So I you're that was probably correct. I'm both. Yeah. That's where I am. It's like I can test either way, mm-hmm. but it's I'm probably just slightly, slightly extroverted. Mm-hmm. But a, too much. And it and it depends where what situations I'm in. Like if I'm in a social situation, but it's not a social situation where I'm like, if it's not people I'm enjoying, yeah, then I get drained so really easy. Sure. But if it's people yeah. I like, then I'm like, I get energy and I'm like, I can I'm hang the, out until 5 yeah, a.m. Yeah, like exact same way. Yep. Yeah. How much do you feel like the photography that you used to do helped you with your business? Oh, I definitely think it helped. I feel like, you know, I just have that creative eye too. And that, of course that opened me up to being more, um, creative visually, I think. So just the way, the way I envision things like on a digital form, you know, on like social media and stuff, I think photography definitely played a role in that. Cause you know, when I would tell people I did photography, they're like, Oh, I can tell like the, the way I present my work, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think that definitely helped. 
I remember what I was going to ask about health. Like, so you don't eat certain things. You found out you have like an autoimmune thing um, a while back. Yeah. Did that kind of spark your interest in health and and stuff like that? Or do, did you care a lot about nutrition and stuff before, but it just didn't work out? No, I never really, I would say when I was, you know, in the service industry, I didn't really care about, I, you know, I would work out on and off, stuff like that. But I never put that as like the forefront focus for me. Um, until I, you know, for years was having so many little issues with my health and I couldn't figure out, go to the doctors and be like, you know, I'm having these symptoms and this and this. And I would just basically get told like, oh, you're fine, whatever. Um, until I was like, no, I know my body. I know something's off. So I went to a functional medicine doctor. It's one of my girlfriends had done that as well. She said, no, you need to go to functional medicine. They typically have a different approach on things and they, you know, not scan, but they test for more things. And so I did that and I found out, yeah, I had Hashimoto's, which so many people have nowadays, especially women too. It's pretty common. Um, and it comes, it's food we eat, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think when I found that out, it was just like a light bulb in my head went off and I was like, I can't live like that anymore. And I had to really just completely flip the way I was doing things. Um, and then I think it just eventually went into, you know, domino effect of like being more into being active and fitness and focusing on like just healthier ways of living. And I mean, that changed my whole entire life. Like I, I literally changed my whole entire life from changing my diet and then my mindset. Um, so yeah, I, I, I highly doubt if I was, I will say this, I highly doubt if I was still eating and doing all the stuff I was in the past and didn't get a grip on that. I probably wouldn't be as like happy and successful as I like currently am. Um, for sure. So. With that, do you have more energy? Like what? Oh, yeah. what, what is your diet like? I know a little bit about it. Like, what do you typically eat? Um, and what was the, um, what was the condition? Did they determine a specific condition you have? They said Hashimoto's, but it's such a weird, it's such a weird thing because they sit you down and they're like, oh, it's a white blood cell thing, but it's not a white blood cell, blood cell thing. It's a thyroid thing. Like there's, mm. I feel like there's not straight answers. I just know my body reacts to foods um, differently and inflammatory foods. So I, I mean, I was insanely strict for the first, I would say couple years with it. And then all my symptoms, literally all my symptoms when I went away. Um, now I, you know, I learned how my body reacts to things. I, I still enjoy things all the time, like, especially now, but I just know for the most part, what I need to stay away from, which is like, Gluten, I still enjoy gluten whenever, you know, but it's not, it's not like common. I used to eat gluten every weekend. Now I'm like, oh, I'll have like this or that. Um, So I just have to like balance now, but I stay away from gluten, pretty much anything inflammatory. I never, like you, if you looked in my house and my pantry, like I never, I spent way too much money because I have to shop at the healthy grocery stores, but, um, you know, I don't buy anything with refined or fake sugars. Um, try to stay away from anything that's like, you know, you know, all the like bad ingredients pretty much. Um, so I have to be strict with those things, but I still enjoy what I want to like. It's again, it's just like a balanced thing. I think my body finally got to a place where I was able to handle certain things after it, I eliminated a lot from my diet for so many years. So yeah, I just have to like watch what I, what I eat, but I typically do. I did do paleo for a while, but I feel like, yeah, I just do like protein and how to do like a high protein. I, I, yeah, I would say more like paleo based. 
when you were like really strict, what, what, what was really strict for you? Well, I mean, I didn't like before. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I definitely wasn't doing gluten at all. I would go to restaurants and cry because like everything had gluten in it. And I was like, I cannot even allow myself. So it was miserable. And then you did no dairy like, too, right? Huh? You did no dairy too, didn't you? No dairy too. Um, like and, but cheese it was and weird. gluten or everything. Yeah. And it was weird because once you do elimination diet, which is what I did in the beginning when I found out I had Hashimoto's, when you eliminate everything from your system, as soon as you reintroduce things back in, you know, like within like 15 mm. minutes, if it's going to mess you up. So that was a really good indicator of what I could and couldn't have. Um, so I kind of just rode that for a while. But When you started having issues with your health, was that like gradual or was it like, was it your whole life? I, I don't even know. No, I think, um, man, I don't even know. I just noticed, I probably noticed from like early twenties, maybe that I was just like fatigued and bloated and felt just like, you know, from, I was eating, I never, I was eating terrible. Like yeah. probably. I, yeah, I don't know. I just did not have a good diet and um, it bogged me down for, for a lot of years. And I, I really wish that I would have got a handle on it before because kind of sad that I put myself through all that misery for so long, but it's hard because food tastes amazing. Right. Yeah. But, but there, I didn't care about what I ate too much until Holly and I started dating uh-huh. and she's got it in my brain now to constantly look at labels Yeah, and I will, there's things I see at the grocery store all the time now. I'm like, I want that. And I think about getting it. And then I look at the label and I'm like, Mm -hmm. Oh, high fructose corn syrup. I'm not going to get that. It's like, Like, you have to have the self control, like it embedded in your brain. And it's hard. It takes time to like, to create that self control too. But same thing. I, I, when I would go grocery shopping, I had to make it fun though, because I would go to the grocery store. I'd read every single label. I'd be in there forever. Um, but I think with like the gluten-free recipes and everything, I would try to make it fun because if not, I would have just been so miserable. So, What's what's fun about poisoning people? Because you poisoned me that one time with that one soup, right? What soup? <laughs> <laughs> oh I got really God. sick. It was like lemon something... I don't think it was a soup. I don't know what that means with that too, by the way. (laughs) I was like so excited. I'm like, I mean, homemade soup. And then for the week you were like, you poisoned me. And what did you put in that? And I was like, oh my (laughs) God, I put love in that. That's what I put in there. I don't know what it was that got me sick, but yeah. That's hilarious. No, you you make good food. I I think you actually remember that too. (laughs) Well, I got pretty (laughs) sick. Did you say you make good food? Okay, we'll remember You make good food, yeah. 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 Um, it's kind of crazy, all the crap that's in our food, though, isn't it? Like, uh, yeah. It's, it's sick. As, I mean, uh, go ahead. Especially like being kids in the 90s, right? Because you were like, we we're both 90s kids. Mm-hmm. And what did we have for like breakfast? Cereal, like, which yeah, is just sugar, sugar and carbs and yeah. gluten. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, I still eat gluten and everything, but there, I look back in that, and I ate cereal as an adult a few times too. I look back on the crap that we ate, like, that all the kids around us ate too. Yeah. And it's pretty wild. Like, oh, yeah. everything has, you know, everything's processed and has a ton of sugar. Sugar's in everything right now. Yeah. And then it's once you get wild. used to eating, eliminating most of the poison, I mean, we can't fully eliminate it because it's just literally in everything. But once you, clear your body of a lot of that. I don't even think things taste the same. Like I, I don't even think if I ate real, like the fake cereal, I would even enjoy it. Cause I, I just mm. don't, there's a lot, it's, there's a lot of times that I, you almost feel like it's fake. Like you can taste that things aren't like real. Um, so I think your taste buds change too with that, but yeah, there's so you go to, you go into a store and you pick up a cookie and there's like, 50 ingredients when I just had this really amazing cookie made out of like oats and like four ingredients and it tastes way better to me. 
So I just don't yeah. understand why we have to feel, I get preserving things, but like, I just don't, you know, we're being poisoned obviously on purpose, but. Yeah, it's pretty wild when I see you see just this huge list of ingredients and you're like, I don't even know what half of this stuff is without looking it yeah. up. I'm like, you know, and, and you'll see different ingredients with the, they'll disguise ingredients with different words. You know, there's yeah. like 10 different words that they use for basically sugar. Well, and, and then like, I know the big one and it's in so many things, but um, when they, and I, you, I, you would have to fact check this one, but uh flavor i think it's natural flavor that mm. that one they can hide up to 40 ingredients under that one thing which is insane yeah then holly pointed this out to me too is like natural kind of means nothing yeah like it's it's a word that mm-hmm. attracts people who want to be healthy but it actually is nothing healthy at all yeah. like it's Anytime just like, I oh, see natural that, I pick flavors. It up and put it back down. Yeah. So. Yeah. What was what was the hardest food for you to let go of? Uh, bread. <laughs> what? Bread. Bread. <laughs> yeah, I love bread. Uh, but now, I mean, I eat bread. I do sourdough. Sourdough doesn't bother me one bit. It's weird. Um, Gluten free breads, they've gotten so much better. So I'll do that. I mean, I'll enjoy real bread once in a while but nowadays it's like there's so many like options out there i mean a lot of places they like there's a place we go in east they do really good like um sourdough pizza so it's like i can enjoy the pizza and then i can enjoy a certain amount of dairy to where i don't feel sick so it's kind of that's how i kind of balance it but you know i think i think restaurants are getting really good about having like actual good quality uh health options now gluten-free and stuff but yeah yeah what are the things that you care most about like high level what are the things that you care most about in the world like 20 years 30 years when you look back or or let's say at your funeral what do you want people to like say about you what what do you want to have accomplished by the time you leave the earth Man, I feel like that's a heavy question. <laughs> Sorry, what? I feel like that's a heavy question. That is a heavy question. Um, what would I want people to say about me on my funeral? Or not even say about you, but what do you want to... Like, is there anything that you haven't accomplished yet that you want to accomplish? Oh and like, Yeah. There, I mean, there's so many things. I always... And I always feel like there's so many things I could be doing. But, yeah, I don't even know. Like, I... I, you know, I feel like I'd want to be, when I leave here, known for, like, I feel, man, that is so hard. (laughs) That's really hard. I just want to be known as a good person, I think. I don't think at the end of the day, the successes and all that really even measure up to, like, the way you make people feel and the energy you put out for people, so... I don't know. I feel like that's a hard one. How do you define being a good person? Because some people will say like, oh, you have to be giving to charities or whatever it might be. Intention. Um, Yeah. Intention. That's huge. Um, The way you treat people. And I think the way you treat yourself too, because that's most important is how you treat yourself. But how you treat other people, your intention, authenticity. I think doing things with your heart involved, I don't know. How do you go about treating yourself right? Because that's hard for people. Like oh, that's yeah. probably one of the, because uh, you know, some people say treat yourself like you're one of your best friends. That's like good advice to that's hard sometimes. change the way that you, I've seen a lot of people like, I've seen people have, uh, journals where they, you know, they'll write things down and say, this is, this is how I would talk to me myself if I were somebody else, a friend that I cared about and stuff like that. But, you know, the way that we talk to ourselves matters a lot. I've struggled with like negative self-talk at times. I, I, I would, I would imagine you have a bit too. Oh, yeah. in your life. Like what helped you with that? Like what changed for you? 
Um, I mean, the self-love journey is, I feel like, never-ending. I think it all, it changes at different parts of our life, too, and what we go through. I don't think it's just a one-way thing. Um, but I will say, at least from my own experience, my self-talk, the way I talk to myself and treat myself, is always better when I'm doing things proactively to take care of myself, which is staying active, um, being more connected spiritually, doing things that I know at the end of the day are helping me to grow and helping me evolve and be a good person. And um, when I can sleep better at night, knowing I am consistently doing those things, I think I talk to myself way better. Um, But I do, I mean, there's, self-love journey it's it's it can be up and down for sure because I do the same thing I get in these weird spaces where I'm like negative talk to myself and I can't get out of it and then I finally get out of it and I'm like why would I do that to myself like I'm you know so I don't know do you feel like the company you keep has changed a lot throughout your life because I feel like it has like knowing you I like I feel like the quality not that you didn't have some good friends before, mm-hmm. but I feel like the quality of relationships that you have, and I'm not even involved in a lot of, I don't know a lot of your friends at this point, yeah. but I feel like you have better friends. I, I feel like you have better relationships. Oh yeah. Um, do you have any insight into how that changed? Is that just a matter of respect for yourself or what? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that's a good point though. The The, the company you keep really is so important and I've done a lot of eliminating people that weren't good for me um out of my life and um I feel like I'm big on energy too so I feel like I got I I feel like over the years I got really good at sensing out good and bad energy in a person too um And I try to stay away from people that are like that with bad energy because it's only going to, you know, that's only going to seep into your life. And so, yeah, my like friend groups and stuff, everything has changed over the years. And I've, I've just really tried to keep more people in my life that are kind of on like the same mission that really just want to like be good to other people and really want to like achieve their dreams and do good things and um, love what they do. And, you know, I think that's really important. And like, since I've been out to Nashville, I literally have created some of like the best friends that I've probably ever had. I mean, Vegas was kind of rough. I feel like I had some good friends out there, but I, I really think if anything, I feel like I can't, I was supposed to come to Nashville also to find my, what do they call it? Your like your tribe, you know, yeah. I found some really good, obviously like my best friend doesn't live here. And I have a couple other really close friends that don't live here. And those are my people, but I do think um, coming to Nashville is really good for me. Cause I created this network of people that I just really feel comfortable with and really feel good about. And, um, you know, it's good energy, good people. So, Well, a couple of questions about Nashville then. Like, first of all, what drew you to Nashville above other places? Uh, yeah, so start with that and then I'll ask you something else about Nashville. I don't know. I Well, we had a friend that would always speak highly of it. And I'm like, okay, I need to go out there and visit. Um, I always wanted to kind of go somewhere back that was like similar to the Midwest where we're from, but somewhere that was like cool and had like, you know, the music scene and creatives and obviously Nashville's changed like so much, but I came out here and visited, I think once or twice. And Larry was like, this is the coolest city. Like I can see myself living here. And I was like all about it. Even before I visited here, I just like, I get something in my head and I'm like, that's what I'm doing, you know, even Mm -hmm. if it happens years later. Um, so I think, uh, 
yeah, I manifested the move out here because it was like in the making for years. And then, you know, finally came out here, visited and then fell in love with it and decided to move. So. Well, you were thinking about Oregon for a little bit. So what, <laughs> so like when you compare that. Oregon and, and Tennessee, why Tennessee over Oregon? Well, or no, Oregon was like when I was, I was visiting Oregon a ton in my early twenties, probably mid twenties, like early mid twenties. Um, Cause I had some friends out there and I just loved it. I thought I was going to central Oregon. I thought it was like the coolest place. And, uh, and then it's beautiful there. Portland. And, um, then I went through a breakup and I was like, I'm getting out of here. And so I'm like going to Portland and I went and looked at places out there and then it just didn't, it, it ended up falling through cause I ended up meeting my last partner. And then, um, yeah, I don't think that's where I was supposed to be at all. I don't I I I don't even know where my life would be if I would have moved out there. Um but the the more recent, you know, idea to come out here was it was either Denver or Nashville. And I love Denver, but I just think um there was more more things about Nashville that I was um liking, so I like I like Denver too. I like I've been to Nashville once to visit you. I like Nashville. I think it's pretty cool. Um, how long were you in Vegas again? 16 years. Too long. I never moved. I mean, you moved because uh, you were so young enough where when mom and dad moved there that it made sense for you to move too. Yeah. And and they wanted me to move there and I didn't want to. I've never liked Vegas. I don't. I. You've been there way more than me. I feel like it's a very superficial city. Vegas? Do you feel like that's so? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't have too many good things to say about Vegas, unfortunately. I know there's I know there's pros and cons to everywhere. I just never really felt like it was home there though. It's not and it's yeah. not that I hate the place. I just don't one, I'm not a desert girl. I love the greenery. I love like this, you know, like more of the vibe in Nashville. Um and I just feel like the people there, I just think what that city is about is nothing that I necessarily relate to. I feel like it's a, yeah, it's a lot of superficial and um, morally, it's just the energy there is very interesting too. I just don't think it's the greatest place, but you know, obviously I've met some amazing people there and yeah, stuff like that, but. Not, it's not my favorite place. Never felt like it was home. I feel like Nashville yeah. feels like home to me. Do you think you'll be in Nashville for the foreseeable future? Um, probably for a while. I mean, I bought my house here, and so I think I'm probably uh, planted here for a little bit. But I mean, that's that's doesn't have to be permanent. I I would love to build a house out here. I think even if it's like a little bit out from like, you know, the general area of Nashville, but I don't know, who knows? I'm open. I'm open, but I'm also like, I love Nashville. So, and I feel like a lot yeah. of people that end up moving come back here too. So. Everything's cool there, except for the traffic. I hated the traffic there. <laughs> it's uh... true, but it's, well, okay. So where I moved, I don't even really deal with traffic. Like the area I moved to now, um, it's so nice. I mean, we're like eight, minutes from my studio i never hit traffic really going home or um going there uh and you tend to kind of stay in your general area out here too and it probably has to do a lot with the traffic but yeah the traffic has gotten way worse out here but i still think it's like even when i went back to vegas vegas never had traffic and now i, I go back and i'm like what the heck is going on so i think everywhere has just gotten busier and more populated so so you, you were doing, you were having a lot of success in Vegas and then you moved to Nashville and you, you still, I think you were going back to Vegas occasionally to do yeah. a couple of jobs there. Um, but you established yourself in Nashville. Like, how was that for you? Like, obviously that's a big change. A lot of people, once they're established somewhere, they won't move. They'll just stay there and ride it out. But you decided to take the risk and go to Nashville rebuild your business entirely 
Um, like, what were the struggles with that? Um, what were the exciting parts? Like, where and what what made you decide to do that? Leaving, obviously, you didn't like Vegas, but it it still seems like that's a pretty heavy decision to rebuild yeah. in a new city. Um. I just think I had a lot of faith in myself. I trusted myself and I'm glad I did because it worked out. Um, but that was, that was the biggest part for me was taking, taking the chance on myself and which I think more people should do. And luckily it worked out. Like I, of course, scary to like start all over. I mean, I had no clients here. I luckily knew maybe like, two people out here, but the way I started to get clientele was I started to advertise on my socials, uh, probably like six months prior to even moving. And so I started getting people engaging that lived out here and it just popped off because there wasn't a lot of, I mean, when I first moved out here, I knew like one fine line artist. There was in, in even permanent makeup is because I was still doing that when I moved out here, but it quickly transitioned into tattooing. I there was not a lot of permanent makeup people out here either, or at least of quality. And so mm. I think I just really got lucky also coming in at like the right time too. So um yeah. How do you how did you pursue or navigate making friends in a new city in your thirties? Because a lot of people feel like after high school or college, whatever people go to, uh, that's like the easiest time to make friends. And then after that, it's like, you're basically stuck with the friendships that you have. Right. And like they, it feels awkward for many people to navigate building new friendships later in life. Um, well, luckily my clientele is mainly all women. <laughs> mm. So right there is how I've created so many friends and, um, connections. And some of my very close friends now are, were first clients. So, um, I did, I think at first it was a, a little bit of a struggle. I mean, putting yourself out there is kind of hard to, especially like you said, when you're in your thirties, you're not, you know, going to school and doing all that. And so, um, I think, yeah, having my clientele is really what connected me to like my friend group. So that was really nice to have. Does that ever get hard? Sometimes people, when they're friends with people, the friends want discounts when you're in a certain kind of industry and people want that discount. Does that get hard to navigate friends and business? I don't think so. I don't think I've had to really deal with like the downside of that, fortunately. So, I mean, you know, once in a while you have people that expect things, but I don't, I don't really deal with that. I feel like the people that I have in my life are, um, yeah, I just don't feel like I have to really deal with that. So. Uh, where would you be without a dog? Nowhere. How how important is Benny to like? I know he's everything uh, to you. It's but... his birthday today, so four oh, happy years birthday, old. Benny. Um. Oh man, my dog is like the most important thing ever. He's so special. He's like an actual angel. Why do you wait? Uh, as long as you did to get a dog. Uh, I don't know. I just wasn't ready for that responsibility. Um. The person that I was with, they didn't, I don't think wanted one at the time. Mm. Uh, I, and then I got to a point where I'm like, I want a dog so bad. And then, you know, made that happen shortly after. And then, uh, best thing I ever did. Yeah. yeah. Benny's a cool dogs dog. Dogs are literally angels. They teach us a lot too. And he's taught me a lot of patience because got to have it with him. So. Yeah, I feel like um, I've had a cat, and cats can definitely cat love too. you. I always forget. <laughs> you have a cat too, but uh, but he's he's in the back burner now. Yeah, Milo she's, is, right? she's on the back burner. She she's no. on the back burner. <laughs> I would always say that to you when you got Benny. I would always give you crap and be like, "Do you still have a cat?" 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, dogs are needier. Just, I mean, right? she sleeps like, all day. So it's like, yeah. I don't like, she just fends for herself. She just does her own thing. Benny over here is like, I need attention every second. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I feel like dogs are, maybe there's other animals that can teach you this. I'm, I've never owned other animals than a cat and well, I've owned a few other animals, but um, dogs teach you unconditional love. And I feel like, I feel like the two places you can get unconditional love are from your mother and a dog. True. So, yeah, yeah. it's very true. Uh, what do you feel like Benny has taught you the most? Like, what are some things that you've learned from your dog? Hmm. He's like eyeballing me right now on the floor. I mean, patience for sure. Uh, yeah. Responsibility. I mean, not that they didn't have responsibility before, but you know, it's like a child. So, you know, they rely solely on you and you're like, you know, you're their whole world. So, um, and I just think like healing and love is, you know, it's definitely like their love is definitely unconditional. That's for sure. Do you, there's it's probably hard. Better, there's like, probably a better answer in me for that, but it's all I can think of right now. No, I, I feel like they give you so much. Um, like when I'm, when I'm having a bad day or a bad moment, like my dogs are the first place I go. Oh yeah. I go to Holly too. Like she's, she can give me a lot of, uh, positive reinforcement in my life, obviously. But I feel like if I just want to like be there in my feelings, mm -hmm. I just go cuddle my dogs, you know? Yeah. And they're just the always way. down to do what you want. And Benny so. is like, he's so, it's funny because they say your animals are like you, you know, they mirror you, but he is so intuitive. Like it's, it's kind of crazy. And he's, he's just so tuned in. So I can like sniffle if I'm like, sad or upset and I don't even have to be looking his way and he's like licking my eyeballs like what's wrong with you or he I'll yeah. be like upset and not even say anything and he'll just look at me he just knows it's they're so they're it's fascinating but yeah and you're protective of them too I know that I've seen you scold people for letting their dogs get too close yeah I mean he's <laughs> it was cute though today we uh Cause it's his birthday. So I took him to the dog park today and I was leaving and some lady walked up and she was like, your dog has heart eyes for you. And I was like, that is the cutest thing I've ever heard. I was like, that's so sweet. I'm like, he does. He's fixated on me like all the time. Um, you know, he's always looking to me for validation and a lot of things, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I am protective of him. Why shouldn't I be? It's like my child. I don't. I, I hate when people aren't protective of their dogs. They just let their dogs do whatever. And I'm like, are you trying to get your dog killed in the road? Like, you don't even care that it's running away from you? I just, I don't know. I just, yeah, I, I treat him as he's my child. So that with that comes being protected. Yeah, and it's different than a child, too, because like a, a dog is never going to have that autonomy that a child is going to right so like you raise a child and you give them certain boundaries and then you uh eventually that child is going to grow off and grow up and have a life of its own yeah. without you right. um, but a dog is never going to a dog is always going to be dependent on you in some way or in many ways and so there's that difference of like you know you you have to make sure that you have your dog on a leash and you know, like you, it's your responsibility if yeah. your dog runs into the street or anything like that. Right. So you always have to be mindful of those things. Yeah. Your dog is never going to grow out of that. Although like they get more calm over time. Like, Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like, uh, do you feel like Benny's gotten, so I've had three dogs now other than Barrett when we were younger and I've had uh, three dogs of my own. And I feel like, so Zoe is like a year and a year and six months, I believe right now, roughly. And Bandit lived until he was seven. Charlie is 10. And I feel like 
So I got Banda when he was around one, maybe a little bit younger. And I got Charlie, who was one to one and a half, I would say. And I feel like that, like, because you got Benny when he was a puppy. Yeah. He was like a few weeks old, right? Like six, eight weeks old. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like at a year, between a year and two years is when like, I feel like things settle in. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like the dogs are, they are more willing to just cuddle and more oh, yeah. like just relax. Whereas like that first year, they want to just be all over the place. Well, that, and I think it takes time to kind of connect with your animal too. Yeah. You learn each other. And it's like, I remember like the first year I didn't feel nearly as connected as I, I mean, it, it only makes sense, but like, you know, they're still a puppy. They're just running wild. And it's like, I think once they, you know, hit like one or two, or I would say like for him, like two, you know, calm down a little bit. And then was, um, I could connect with him more and he's super cuddly showed his vulnerable side more, you know? So yeah, yeah. I definitely think, but still hyper as hell. Well, I have an Australian shepherd, so that's probably not going to change. He, and it's funny because people would be like, for a really calm person, you have a really hyper dog. I'm like, I swear he's not always like this. He goes out in public. It's a different story, but yeah, yeah. Do you think you'll get another one? Yeah, I know I'd we've talked to. about it a little bit. Yeah, I would like to. I think I'm just waiting for the right time, though. I don't he's a lot of work, and I I don't know if getting another one. I it, people say it helps, you know, um, but I'll probably wait a little bit. But I would love to. Maybe next year. It can help. It can also make them, depending on the dog, mm -hmm. it can make them feel like, like, I feel like Charlie, I, I think he likes having another dog around, but he also likes not having another dog yeah. around and he likes being the center of attention. He doesn't like sharing the limelight. Yeah. And that's Benny too. Know. Cause he doesn't even like when Milo comes and sits on me, he's like mm. checking her out like my mom. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. But I did watch his brother. I told you about that, his half-brother. And as much as I thought, you know, he doesn't like when he's not getting all the attention, but didn't think he was going to even want to play with the dog. And then they literally wouldn't leave each other alone for the whole week. They were playing, like, every second. So it was cute to see. And I'm like, I could totally see him having, like, a brother or something. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. But. It's a little different with a second dog in many situations, too, because... Your first dog is like you, like all about you. Yeah. And then sometimes the second dog is like all about your other dog. Ah, <laughs> so yeah. I noticed I that with Zoe all the time. That. That's funny. Yeah. Zoe is like fixated on what Charlie is doing. And Charlie is, you know, the grumpy dog that doesn't want anything to do with other dogs. And he growls when she's around, only occasionally plays with her. But still, she's like always like she's obsessed with him. Like it's like, oh, what's he doing? If he gets up, she's like, what's he doing right now? <laughs> like, just <laughs> really curious about him. So, Cute. yeah. Well, Marissa, it's been awesome talking to you. Um, <laughs> I always like to ask people about books they read. I don't think you're a big reader, but I could be wrong. Unfortunately, Are you not a big I'm not reader? a reader. I would love to yeah. say that I was, but I can't lie in here. So, no, I'm not. I'm not a reader. I wish I was. I know it's good for you, but you don't even do not. audiobooks, huh? Um, I have. Uh, I don't um, typically, but I have. I've, I've listened to a few, probably not all the way through, but yeah. Yeah, I, I bought you a book like a year ago. You probably haven't even I opened don't know it. Where have you? <laughs> <laughs> don't come at me. <laughs> uh, well, what do you think are. What's something you feel like the whole world could benefit from if more people had more of it or enacted it more in their lives? Hmm. Self-awareness. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I I can't remember who I was talking to recently or where I was or anything like that, but it might have been at Freedom Fest. Maybe. I don't know. But somebody was asked, what is one quality all self-made millionaires have? And like, what's the most important quality or something like that for all 
to become a self-made millionaire or wealthy, independently wealthy? And the answer was self-awareness, actually. Huh. Which it makes sense because like if you're not self-aware, you might stumble into money or whatever it might be, but it I don't think you're going to I think you might get lucky and end up with some wealth. But it's gonna be hard to keep on hold on to that wealth too. Like yeah. and maintain that wealth because if you're not self aware as you gain success, you're gonna have more people like you see this with uh, athletes and stuff all the time, right? Where it's like you have more people around you, like trying to get a little piece yeah. of what you have, yeah. Because not everyone can achieve that, and if you're not self aware, then you're going to be more likely to give in to those situations and and not know who your friends and who aren't your your real friends are. Sure. You'll make bad business decisions. There's just a ton that I think self awareness accounts for. So when you said that, it just reminded me of what that person said. So. so what you're saying is I had a great answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you to share with anything else you want to share with people and then uh, tell people how they can find you on Instagram and where they can go for your website Okay. and uh, anything else you have coming up or anything like that. Okay. Um, I can't think of anything I have coming up right now. Um, but you guys can find me on socials with this Instagram. I really am only on Instagram, but my Instagram is wild honey artistry and you can literally view any of my work on there. I share a lot of like personal stuff too mixed in with, um, my work just because I feel like people can connect a little bit better with me that way. Um, but yeah, wild honey artistry. And then my website is wildhoneyartistry.com pretty easy but um yeah how far in advance do people usually have to book with you oh okay um that's a good question too i typically book out three months in advance um <laughs> it's so funny because like i just i love when it, booking day is the most like stressful thing ever but i have clients that come in they're like it's like the hunger games trying to get into you it's just like I'm so grateful and it's like such a compliment, but I do feel bad because I'm like, oh, people are, you know, it's, it is hard to get in because I do only release three months at a time. So, um, but that's just the easiest way for me to like operate my life. So, um, usually book three months out right now, my next booking for like October through December will probably release in I would say early September. So usually I release the dates like a month prior. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Marissa, it's been fun talking to you. I, it's, you know, for the 50th episode of yeah. the podcast, which this will be the 50th episode. I'm like, I want to get somebody amazing for that. I couldn't get that person. So I asked you instead. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I've wanted to interview you for a while and yeah, you were the, I've told you weeks ago that I wanted to interview you for the 50th. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen. And, yeah. uh, there's, I love that. there's like a little bit of, uh, self-consciousness about interviewing you. Cause I'm used to interviewing people I don't know, or, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing them on their body of work and it's different yeah. interviewing somebody that you know so well. And it's like, what do people want to know? And like, where, where should I explore? And I actually felt like this was way more comfortable than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to like not be able to hold my laughter in the whole time, which <laughs> there's moments of that, but like, yeah, you make it comfortable. So that's great. You reach out. I was having trouble not laughing in the first like <laughs> minute. I was like, <laughs> it just. Well, I'm, I always just in like weird, like FaceTime and stuff like that. So odd. it's always been so weird to yeah. me. So I, I have a hard time taking myself serious, but you know, it was a good time. It's fun. Yeah, well, I'll have to have you on again in the future sometime. So yeah, maybe we'll do it in time. person next time. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm doing more and more in person. That's where I want to go with this eventually. But yeah. economically, it just makes sense to do remote for now. So yeah. anyway, Marissa, thanks for joining me. No it's problem. been awesome talking Thank to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. 
If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.